Fishing Obsessed Podcast. We'll be sitting down with a fresh guest each week. Someone who shares the same kayak fishing passion that runs through our veins. We're talking kayak anglers, kayak companies, lure experts. Heck, anyone who's got a story to tell about landing the big ones from a kayak. We're setting our sights on becoming the number one kayak fishing podcast in the world. You'll get a chuckle, a grin, and hey, maybe even a belly laugh. Because we believe in the power of humor. But above all, we're here to educate and inspire. So, whether you're a seasoned kayak angler or just dipping your toes into this exhilarating world, join us on the Kayak Fishing Obsessed Podcast. It's time to reel in adventure, camaraderie, and the joy of the catch. Here's your host, Darren Wendell. Hey guys and gals, welcome to podcast episode number 52 of the Kayak Fishing Obsessed live show brought to you by the Wendell Fishing YouTube channel. Coming up on 1,000 videos, we have daily shorts, weekly videos, weekly live shows. I mean, I, I even have daily like community posts, which is pretty awesome. So if you haven't checked that out yet, please head over. Love to see you over there. Hope you all had a fantastic Christmas. Uh, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Be thinking about and be prepared to share some of the things that maybe you received for Christmas around fishing and kayak fishing and all that, all that jazz. Um, also on Facebook, uh, launched a new group called Kayak Fishing Freaks. If you're a fishing freak, I'd love to see you over there. I think we had like 50 new people just this past week, a week alone. So it is rocking and rolling, which is exciting. So love to see you over there if you were on Facebook and uh what's the latest oh i got a, I got a small batch run of trucker hats um these are like nice trucker hats right these are richardson's 112s um i have a couple different colors i got charcoal black camo and i got some beanies rolling out so i don't make any really make any money on these the margins are too low uh they're priced, priced at like 29 dollars a hat shipping's free i eat the tax all the PayPal fees, Shopify fees, the boxes, the tape, the time, essentially selling these close to cost because y'all are freaking awesome. So I'll throw, actually, I'll do that right now. I'll throw the link if you're interested in grabbing one of those on, let me make sure it goes everywhere. All destinations. There it is, folks. All right. That is over there. Remember, this is an interactive podcast, so love for you to ask your questions. I will do my best to get them answered during the show. Uh, and of course, I love when you guys just converse with one another. So feel free to have conversations over there in the side. But let me bring on my guest tonight, Jameson Redding, who hosts Road Trip Angler. My man, welcome to the show. How you doing? Good. How are you? I'm doing good. So I think the first time I met you was actually kind of like in Chad Hoover's trailer, which is kind of weird. You were in Chad Hoover's trailer. I was having Chad on the show. I He introduced me to you for a hot second. That was the first time, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> what were you doing down there? Uh, so I think that particular time uh, I had brought down one of the new Kusa X's when we were launching that boat when I was working at Jackson and just wanted to have him kind of go through it, check it out and, he wanted to do a review on his channel and a few other things. So we were kind of doing that over the couple of days that I was down there. Oh, nice. And I, I think I remember Chad's review on the Cusack. So mm -hmm. that it's all, it's all coming back to me now. <laughs> but one of, the, one of the number one questions I love to ask, one of the first questions, not I met you in Chad Hoover's trailer, um, but how is it that you got into fishing? How long ago? Um, second oh. question, why did you start filming? And third question, like, what do you do for a living? Which is kind of fun. So before you answer all three of those in succession, write in the comments what you received for Christmas that is fishing or kayak fishing related. And we're going to start talking about that a little bit. And uh, all right. So back to those questions. Hit me. Oh, that's a, yeah, it's a lot. Let's see. Got into fishing. Uh, I guess I, I don't remember, honestly, the first time I went fishing. I was pretty young. Um, I do remember just, you know, kind of farm pond hopping with my grandparents, with my dad. Uh, there was a pond that we could get through uh, to through the woods close to my house. And it was a pretty good sized pond, like I'd say four or five acre pond. And it had crappy and, and uh, large mouth. But we would go down there and we had a little 10 foot John boat. I think he bought it like Walmart 
like back in the day when they sold John boats. All right. And uh, we keep that down there and just go and, and, you know, on a Sunday after church or something, we'd go crappy fishing, throwing rooster tails, you know, whatever. So, you know, been in the outdoors and fishing since I was little. I think the passion really developed. Uh, I moved to Pensacola, Florida from the foothills of North Carolina, where I live now and where I grew up. Uh, so moved down there to go to college and, you know, was used to hunting, was used to being outside, was used to fishing. And, and all of a sudden now I'm living in what I consider to be a pretty big city compared to where I grew up. So <laughs> all right. I went a little stir crazy for a minute. And uh, then I was like, okay, I, I got to go fishing. So we started doing a little bit of saltwater fishing, trying to catch redfish. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, <laughs> and then I met my now wife. And uh, when I started dating her, her dad would go wade the flat grass flats and uh, try to catch speckled trout. And uh, so started doing that a little bit. And it just kind of really got me, you know, it was there's a lot of water. So that was kind of my thing that I wanted to do, you know, when I wasn't in school or work was to go try to you know catch some some trout and i really didn't start targeting redfish until later but i'd say that all led to when i moved back from florida i lived there for like seven years and moved back to north carolina why the move back so i had a towel company actually after college <laughs> down uh, what hold tile. on i laid tile. tile i thought you said towel i'm like what you're selling <laughs> towels what's yeah, going I was selling on towels. It was, uh, very lucrative. <laughs> No, uh, I was doing tile down there. Everything's tile, right? So like they don't, you know, do a lot of carpet, hardwood, sand, tile is the thing. So I learned to do that through college and then started my own business and did that for a while. But in 2008, the economy just kind of like, oh yeah, fell out. And most of our jobs um, that we did were new construction. And a lot of those, those home builders were just like, yeah, we're, we're done. Or they started building like lower budget uh, track homes with linoleum and carpet, which I had no idea how to do carpet or linoleum. And we started doing a lot of remodels and uh, just got tighter. And anyway, my dad owns a fence company here in North Carolina that he's been uh, doing for over 40 years. Oh wow! And that's what I had done kind of through high school and even in middle school and whenever I was old enough to go with him and work. So he asked me to come back and help him. And that's what I moved back to do. So my wife and okay. I moved moved back to North Carolina in like 2008, 2009 and uh, started doing the fence thing. But I had this, like I needed to be on the water. You know, that's what I've been doing. Like for the, I actually owned a boat when I was in Florida. Okay. And so I had sold that knowing I was moving back here and didn't think I would be using it. And I just kind of wanted to figure out, you know, get everything settled before I like, started buying toys again. So anyway, uh -huh. I started doing a lot of river fishing with a couple of buddies that I still fish with a lot today. And we would go wade um, the new river and the Yakin river and just different rivers and try to find places to fish. And we ended up getting a canoe at some point. I think one of my buddies had it, uh, Eric Krause. And we tried to do that. It wasn't really working, but we started kind of looking into kayaks and uh, I think this was about the time that uh, actually Jim Salmon's show um, was on television and I'd watch it, the kayak fishing show. Okay. And I just remember thinking like, man, like I feel like this kayak thing could be the right thing to do. And I, I want to say this was like 2009. <laughs> this thing might take off. Yeah. This might be the way to access water, you know, that I can't get to. Like we're waiting, we're doing all this stuff and we just can't, like we're not finding the right way to access where we want to fish. Got it. And so the three of us went and bought, all three of us went and bought kayaks the same day. And uh, the only shop close to us that sold kayaks only sold wilderness systems. So we actually all bought, uh, they bought tarpons and I wanted to be able to stand. So I bought a commander, okay. which is not a great boat for the river. It was a cool <laughs> kayak, not a great boat for a river where you have mild whitewater and you might be taking waves over. It's a very open cockpit, like canoe style boat. So after a couple of times of just completely swamping that thing, I actually drilled a hole in the bottom on the stern and put a drain plug in just like a big a bit. Bit <laughs> so that I could drag it up on the shore and slowly let the water out. I could the see the resale the value just plummeting oh, at the was, moment. Yeah. Well, I was like, yeah, what's that hole at the bottom of your, be fine. I put it yeah. there. It's yeah. all good. Don't worry about it. I went kind of crazy here. with that boat too. I like rigged it up. Uh, I think I bought a, trolling motor and i did the whole like self modification cut the shaft off I actually hooked up foot control steering 
Oh, wow. Um, with like steel cable, I got a tractor supply and I had a deep cycle battery in the back and another deep cycle battery in the front. And I wired Wait a, a thousand switch. pounds. Oh, this thing, <laughs> it was like that far, like from being underwater, you know, when you said you're taking it down the river. No, no, that was when oh, I would okay. take it flat water. No, I, I would leave all that at home in the river. But that led me to actually getting into uh, a Jackson Cusa because I knew I didn't have the right boat for river fishing. Right. And the Cusa wasn't even out yet, but I started, you know, doing the Google thing and asking and trying to find like best river fishing kayak. And there's just wasn't a whole lot. Um, you know, I saw Jim in the ocean kayaks. I knew Chad from just research was in the wilderness boats. And I thought about getting like a ride 135 or even the tarpon like my buddies had. Um, but again, the standing thing just kept like, I want to be able to stand and, and, uh, and have, I saw or stumbled across, uh, some of Drew's content and saw that they were going to be working together with Drew Gregory at Jackson to come out with that Cusa, which was designed by a whitewater company. And I thought, well, they should know how to build a river kite. Right. And then with his help, they could get the fishing part down. And so I kind of pre-ordered that, put money down on that boat with like sight unseen and just waited for it to come out. Okay. Um, and that's kind of what led like that led me to get another Jackson to eventually being on the Jackson team. Oh, hold eventually. on. So you, you can't just gloss over that. Like how <laughs> does someone go from like tile to working for pops to, yes. Oh, I'm, 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 I work for the fishing kayak company, which probably sounds freaking awesome for everyone that was listening in right now, by the way. Yeah, it, it definitely was a great run. Um, so yeah, I guess if you want to dive into that a little more, the, of course, so many, so many things quickly. that happened, right? So like, <laughs> I'll say a lot of it was right place at the right time. Also, a lot of it was like just my wife being willing to, you know, kind of be the breadwinner for a bit while I tried to make it work. And then my dad being really cool uh, as the owner of the company and just going like, look, I understand this is something you're passionate about. But I was taking a lot of time off to go fishing, to go fish tournaments. I started fishing the IFA Redfish Tournament Trail or Kite Fishing Tournament Trail. Um, and the reason I did that was because I missed the saltwater and I really just, I wasn't a tournament angler. I'd never fished tournaments, but I wanted to have an excuse really to go to different areas and try to fish salt again. Cause obviously redfish are not here in the mountains of North Carolina, which they were, but I wanted to have that outlet and I was doing a lot of smallmouth fishing and river fishing, but they gave me a reason to like go to, to a coastal area, learn a new area, try to meet some people, pick their brain and try to fish and i actually uh the first season that i did that i uh, didn't do really that well throughout the season but i did good enough uh, by just being at all these different events that i qualified to go to the national championship which was in louisiana and i've never been in louisiana but nice. I ended what year up doing, is this by the way oh my gosh i have to go up and look at the ish at the plaque uh What's ish? it had to have been like 2010 still 2011 okay. Okay, okay. maybe uh I'd have to go back and look, man. I just really, it all kind of runs together because I, I know I went hot and heavy fast. Like I was really just taken, like taken away like by the community that existed at the time and still mm. does. And it's grown so much since then. And also just the fact this was like the time to me when uh, kayak fishing was becoming like more mainstream. So there's a lot of innovation happening very fast like the frame seats, the high-low seating, rod stagers, uh, all that stuff was just getting it really kind of introduced uh, during this time. And there were things like Ocean Kayak had a few fishing kayaks, but a lot of the fishing kayaks were just kayaks with rod holders, like flush mount rod holders. <laughs> Recreational you know, kayak, like, your fishing a holder kayak, in it, you know? there's your and fishing kayak. <laughs> exactly. And so like whenever – I think Jackson, you know, came out with a lot of those innovations and then other brands came out with their innovations and it just started really growing. I know wilderness systems had track on their boats, but there was no yak attack yet. Right. So there's like track, but nothing to put on it. And so it was just like a cool time to really be getting into the sport. And it was very exciting to, to go to these tournaments and see, and they, they were sponsored by Hobie. So you had, and this is right when the pro angler came out as well. Okay. Um, and so all that was going on. And so it was really exciting and I knew it was something that was taking my passion for fishing, like to another level. Like it wasn't just fishing anymore. It was specifically kayak fishing and just this community and this, this innovation and all these brands kind of starting to, to really do some cool stuff and uh, going to those tournaments kind of like 
allowed me to meet a lot of people that felt the same way that I did about it. So other Jackson team members, but also just people that I've had as friends, you know, ever since that first tournament and just going and introducing myself and, you know, you would see those, it was a trail. So you would see a lot of the same faces as, as we traveled from South Carolina all the way. I never fished in Texas, but I fished every state, you know, from South Carolina down to Florida over to Louisiana Okay, and, and during these tournaments. So, you would see a lot of the same faces and you get to hang out with them. You know, uh, you have the w captain's meeting the night before and you just started to make friends. And then uh, there was a thing called the kayak fishing boondoggles that were going on back then. Mm -hmm. um, and some of, some of the guys, uh, guys and gals that are watching might remember uh, the kayak fishing boondoggles, but these were just events where uh, a forum uh, called yak angler um, that kind of came and went there's it still exists um, but this was in the heyday and forums were still kind of the thing you didn't have all the facebook groups as much as you did uh do now and a lot of people would go to forums for information so they yeah. were kind of the the main uh place you would go to learn things about kayak fishing and just talk with other people and so they put on these these boondoggles and i remember going to one of those too and it just again it just kept building on yeah uh, and i went to several but the first one was just like wow look at this community 400 kayak anglers getting together no tournament no reason really other than just to hang out with each other get on the water maybe maybe not <laughs> yeah and it just was. talk talk fishing <laughs> you know so right i just went to a tournament recently and one of the, the biggest feedbacks like oh i wish we had more time together yeah fishing is great but you know a lot of the, a lot of the guys and girls who are part of the kayak fishing community Fishing's awesome, but they they're there for the community. Right? Yeah, it's it really is the community, and the, and again, those boondoggles really showed that to me because there was a lot of people that you know I don't remember a boondoggle that had really good weather to be honest. Like it was always windy or rainy or cold, uh, so it wasn't like oh man, let's just go get on the water. It wasn't it wasn't inspiring that you were going to go catch fish because it'd be in a really cool area. However, everything would just go to crap like the week before, and you're like, yeah, this is going to suck. <laughs> So but like you would Ohio, still go like and you would just sit there and just talk about, you know, kayaking and kayak fishing and just, and really just everything. But, you know, you just, you had so much in common with the people there when it came to kayak fishing that then you realized like, you know, you were meeting people that were going to become like some of your best lifelong friends. And um, so a lot of that just led to me really wanting to figure out a way to do something. And I think, uh, through that and through doing well at that national tournament, the first one I ever fished, I actually placed fourth. Come on um, now. So I was really stoked about that. I was like, well, that, I can do this. Um, and, like four you know, out of five or four out of like 150? Uh, I don't think it was 100, but there was, there might have been really close to that. Like, so All right, and, and they were televised. So I actually was on briefly, had a moment on the show, uh, it was on World Fishing Network. So Nice. As a fan of watching, like I said, Jim Salmon's show back then, and I would record it. My buddies would come over, we'd watch that. It was pretty cool to know that I was going to be on the same network for just that brief second. Oh yeah. Um, of of like holding my plaque and getting forth, and it was just a cool experience. And uh, it, it was a two day tournament, so it had a lot of ups and downs. And I think I went from seventh to fourth. Thought I was doing much better, and then a couple people were sandbagging. And this was back in the day when you had to still bring your like memory card or your phone in with a cable <laughs> and hand it to them. There was no like tourney X or any of these cool software real time stuff. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And uh, so all that just kind of led to me like wanting to figure out a path. And um, actually uh, Brooks Beatty and Drew, I met them. I had gotten on the team and I met them at one of the boondoggles. And I just expressed that like, Hey, I'm, I'm looking to expand this. I don't know if there's ever a way to make a living doing it, but I want to get more involved in the sport. And I had started working part time at a retail shop that's a great outdoor provision company. They have several locations, but they were the closest shop that actually sold multiple brands. Um, okay. So they had Hobie, they had Jackson, Wilderness Systems, New Canoe. They pretty much have all the major uh, brands that exist now and they still do. And so I would work part time there um, just as a sales associate. Um, just so I could like learn more about selling them, be around the boats, talk to people that would come in about uh, kayaks. And I think I worked there off and on for like four years part time. And so that was going on kind of at the same time that I'm doing this tournament thing and trying to get on the Jackson team. Finally got on the Jackson team, expressed that I wanted to to learn or 
do something in kayak fishing. Yeah. And at the time drew was, um, kind of doing a lot of YouTube stuff and, uh, you know, needed uh, the need was, uh, for someone to, to help with video work. And, okay. uh, so I'm like, well, I got like a GoPro, yeah. <laughs> which I just got, you know, it was like the GoPro one. And before that I had like this Kodak play sport, um, which was like, then I had made a camera pole with a painter's pole and some PVC. Oh, yeah. Heck yeah. And uh, so I was already kind of recording and trying. And if you still search on YouTube, not under the road trip angler, but under just my name, there's still some really bad, poorly edited videos that have every transition that you got with the Mac. <laughs> <laughs> with the uh, like i oh, movie yeah. or whatever Going crazy like Transition the page crazy. turn and the water droplets yeah, <laughs> i used them all i'm like well i've already used that one let me just use another one here um so yeah i was doing that a little bit but that he they needed more of that so i went and got a dslr tried to figure out how to turn the thing on and started pointing at that stuff and so that just kind of was my first like step into you know not getting paid at first, but just getting to go on some really cool trips. <laughs> okay. And and then that kind of led to eventually getting getting paid some. And then uh, I helped Drew and, and Brooks with the uh, River Bassin and actually was one of the tournament directors for River Bassin uh, when he was doing that. And we actually started developing some of the software that was kind of the first step into that being able to take a picture and upload it directly to it. Uh, we didn't have an app. It was through a website. You had to actually sign into the website. There was a mobile version of the website. Okay. Um, but he, we used that in river bass. And so it was always kind of nice taking my tournament history and going, okay, this would be so much easier if you could just do this and then someone could see it more live, but we never got it to the point of some of the other ones that have the, the apps now. So, but it's cool yeah. to see that. But the, but the trans, the, the evolution of it all, that was like, right. Oh heck yeah. I do that in oh, a second shoot. over what we have been doing. And then yeah. who knows what it'll be next. Right. Oh, yep. that's awesome. So how did you end up being brand manager of fishing, which is like the most freaking awesome title. <laughs> Anybody, did you pick it? What's going on here? No, Adam I didn't Jackson. actually. So I, I, again, I worked there. Um, so that was my first like getting in there and then it just became like, you know, make yourself available, whatever they need, I'll, I'll do it. And it was a lot of photos, a lot of video content. Um, I have a background in like, I grew up working construction. I grew up on a farm too. My grandpa had a farm growing up and we had cows and chickens. So I've just always kind of had to figure things out on my own, how to do different things. And so like, I want to learn just like how to do it all. I'm like, never going to be great at any of them, but maybe like, if I just know a little bit about it all, I can kind of get by, you know? Yeah. And so at Jackson, that's kind of what I did. I just, I wanted to learn a little about sales. I wanted to go to the trade shows and talk to customers and learn and meet the dealers. And we had used to have these dealer summits at Jackson. So I just got to know all these people. And, uh, at some point, uh, Brooks and I, again, the need's always been content driven. So Brooks and I came up with this idea to do what we called JK Media House. Um, and James, who was our marketing director at the time, kind of gave us the reins to do this. And essentially we would plan an area or a trip with some of the team and we would uh, kind of list out content that we knew we needed, whether it was a new boat coming out, we need that mm -hmm. review and that or that uh we called them a promo video and a, and a walkthrough video. So you kind of had that teaser and then you had the full blown walkthrough and we knew we needed just good stills image imagery for different things. And then like some kind of destination inspirational video, like we build these, like, okay, we're going here and we're going to film these six or seven videos and we're going to come back with all this content and we're going to get to do it with a bunch of really cool people that are on the Jackson team. Right. And that way we can get more faces you know, in front of the camera and just, you know, have a good time. And that'll come across through the videos. And so we started doing that. And, uh, and that was pretty fun too, because I think it inspired him and I to really learn a lot more about our cameras and how to edit and, mm -hmm. you know, kind of led to us doing a lot of that. So we did that really for a long time. And, uh, and then got more involved in R and D as well, just giving input on kayaks that were coming out and and whatnot. And then I think it was uh, right around the COVID time frame when the idea kind of came about to have like a brand manager of whitewater and a brand manager of fishing. And so that's when uh, I was James actually asked me or recommended me, and um, I got put in that position. So that was pretty pretty there cool. You go nice. That's around the time I started coming online. 
around COVID with, okay, I've been thinking about videoing, yeah. YouTube, doing the YouTube thing. And I was like, I just got to do it. I have time. I was off for 10 months out of work. So I was like, oh yeah, here we go. All right, let's circle back to the original question that I asked about what did you get for Christmas? We have a bunch <laughs> of comments over here. So let's go over here. I start them, see if we can get some. Uh, digs Outdoors, money towards the new kayak. Digs, what Sweet. kayak is that? Which one you got your eye on? I'm curious there. All right, what, what else we have here? Rex, add Regum. Man, I picked a great time to tune in. I'm fixing to buy a Jackson NAR come spring. It'll be my first pedal drive. All right, right on. Sweet. Any thoughts on the NAR, Jameson? Since I know that you... Was that around your time when they came yeah, out? Yeah, so the NAR was actually the first boat that I really worked on from start to finish. Like, uh, I, uh, I were, as far as brand manager goes. Um, I was involved with a lot of them, but uh, that was one of the first. And we learned a lot making that boat. I think uh, one of the big things was, and I know there's people in here that probably know this, but we had our drive out for a long time and we always just seemed to have quality control issues with it. We don't manufacture, I say we, I still talk like I work there. It's hard. To, <laughs> yeah, I've been there for over 10 years. So it's really hard not to think that way anymore. Um, but at Jackson, we had a drive. It was cool, innovative, flexible drive shaft kicks up when you go over stuff, but there was always issues with the, the just, I don't know to say quality control, but just like consistency issues. Like you get some that were perfect and last forever and then others would break and you couldn't figure out why. And it, and there was something that we didn't build in house. We engineered sure. it. We had it built elsewhere. We were a rotor molded uh, kayak manufacturer. We're not a mechanical, like we don't do metal <laughs> stuff, right. you know? And um, so one of the things we, we did with the NAR was like, we can't launch another boat. That's a pedal drive boat without really getting this, drive right. In. right and uh so a lot of work and effort went into the new drive and i can say from my personal experience i have the original nar that came off mine with that original drive that i got and i still have had zero issues with that drive it's still just as smooth as it was so i'm re i've been real happy with what we were able to do with the drive and finally keep that kick up technology but really reduce the amount of warranty issues that that were there. Um, and there's things that the NAR, you know, I think, uh, I think that I would love for it to have had more capacity. I think we missed that some, um, in the design, we were trying to make a fast boat and I think we did a really good job making one of the fastest boats, pedal driven boats out there. And, and as far as what I've tested with kayak with motors, you know, torpedoes and whatnot on the back, it's one of the yeah. fastest holes with a torpedo on it as well. Now the trade-off is that, it didn't have the capacity that we thought it would. And we actually, I think, misstepped when we had that capacity written down of where we wanted to hit. We never edited the website when we realized it didn't hit that. And so we had to kind of step that back and make it right for some folks that, um, so that was the only one of the big hiccups with that. And then we had some plastics issues when we launched. So I say it was a very exciting boat. A lot of us that tested and used the boat were super happy with it and super excited about it. And it's still one of my favorite kayaks to date. Um, but we had like this little bit of failure to launch, if you will, due to just problems, kind of some of them outside of our control and some of them, you just, you know, you don't catch everything. And so we learned a ton and I'd say if nothing else, I learned so much from that boat and I still think it's a great, uh, you know, great kayak. I, I used it, uh, filming an episode of the show about two weeks ago down in, in nice. uh, in Florida. And like I said, yeah. it's still my original first out of the gate. Uh, nar that that came off the line so heck yeah i mean i gotta respect the crap out of a company who's like hey you know what we're no kayak's gonna be perfect coming off the line it's just and owning your mistakes mistakes and learning from them and making a better kayak the next time yeah i tip my hat it's, i don't uh, think there's any company in this space i'd say respected company or you know like you go to a, a mom and pop or a uh a brick and mortar retail, not a box store, but if there's a kayak brand in most of those, most of those kayaks, I don't know if there's a brand that doesn't want to make a good kayak, right? Like you're not, you're not out there trying to make a crappy kayak. Like we're passionate people and most kayak brands are owned and ran by passionate people. So um, yeah, yeah, you got to do that. All right. Let's move it on to some other Christmas fun. Uh, grimy fishing, AKA Frank Doucette, a portable, a Berkeley portable spooling station. Right on. 
All right, what do we else have? We got Dual Dude. Got some lures from my wish list. That's how you do it, right? What do you want for Christmas? I already, I already have a list on Amazon that you can choose from. So don't try to buy me a lure that I'm never going to use. And some money for a rod and reel. Right on. Illuminathan. Gift cards to feed my bait addiction. That is 100%. Guys, you know, I'm going to have Nathan on the show sometime. I don't know anybody else that has more lures than this guy in bait and tackle. Like his whole basement <laughs> is like, it's like walking into a bait and tackle store. So look forward to having him on. He sent me a photo of like nine or 10 tackle boxes just full of jigs. That's it. Just jigs. <laughs> it was insane. So I need to get him on the show. Uh, Lost in Tackle said, Christmas mom gave me eight different colored skirts and a casking reel. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I know. I know Lost in Tackle. And when he said his mom gave him skirts, it just... <laughs> I'm not thinking jig skirts. <laughs> someone else. I know there's someone else out here. Here it is, Bucktail. You'll look good in those skirts making your cast bend. There it is. Okay, I'm not the only one. <laughs> hey, you got to fish in something, man. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I guess true. Hey, if you want to do the the kilt thing, go to town. I just can't. No, I'm not going to either. But uh, I hear you. Uh, I do know that after New Year's, I'm getting a. Pennsylvania license and getting an Ohio and West Virginia non-resident license as well. Right on, Diggs. Come over to my side of town. We'll go fishing together. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, I asked Dig what he Diggs what he wanted earlier. An old town 106 PDL. Right on. Nice. And he already has eight hundred dollars toward it so far. Hey man, that's how you do it. That's how you do it. Yak Shore Outdoors. I got money toward a kayak and gift cards to several different tackle shops. Sweet. I love it. Uh, my Christmas was fun. Everybody knows I love fishing, and so everyone always gives me something fishing related. I got these guys. Little Do It Molds Essential Series. Oh, that's awesome. These are the Senko, the Yamamoto Senkos that it's actual mold form. So I, I, I keep all of my old um, plastics, and so I can melt them down. I was like, you know what? You guys see some videos coming out of this, but I just don't want to waste them. I have so yeah, much. Smart. I was like, I'll melt them down, kind of give it my own razzle dazzle when it comes to the salt content, sand content, color, all that stuff. And we'll see what we can do. So I got a couple molds there. Um, 3D Act printed me up some coasters. These are 3D printed coasters, which are pretty <laughs> <Sweet>. awesome. <laughs> I, had, I had a channel member actually send me a gift card to Bass Pro Shops. I got one of those. All start boost max. These are one of those batteries that'll like jump start your car. Yeah. But also will run everything on your kayak, like your uh, so I use those often. So yeah. What about you, brother? What did you get for Christmas? You know, so fishing related, I honestly got zero fishing related things, and that's by what? design. Don't, oh, don't okay. Think, I was about no to one, say. I think about, no one loves me because I'm flip the table <laughs> over. I uh I have so much fishing stuff and i'm so picky about my fishing stuff and what i use and i also have been blessed to have quite a few partners in the industry with having the show and just working in the industry for over a decade so i really just don't honestly need or if i i'll put it this way when i need fishing stuff or if i need fishing stuff I am able to reach out to my partners or i'm able to you know i have ways of obtaining it or getting getting my fishing tackle and I have a ton of it uh, and I'm picky about it. And so it's really hard to ask for, you know, some of the stuff that I would, I would probably purchase for myself because I feel bad about the price level for one. And for two, uh, I just, I have a lot of it. So I got underwear and socks, which is exactly oh, yeah. what I asked for. There and, you go. And uh, so I can't complain <laughs> at all. And I got a knife sharpener. So that's kind of fishing related. Some that's um, loosely adjacent. Yes. I'll give you yeah, that. Loosely adjacent. And uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I tend to try to ask for things outside of it. And again, I think it's because this is what I do for a living and, you know, it'd be like, uh, I don't know, ask him for a pair of work boots. I guess that would be a good Christmas present. Um, but you might want something that's like outside of what you do for a living sometimes for Christmas. So no, I yeah. Hear that's awesome. All right. There's some more, there's the, it kind of the, the, the whole chat kind of blew up on some more stuff. We're not going to spend a bunch more time <laughs> there, but yeah, you do have a bunch of associations. I've noticed on your YouTube channel, um, you got 
connections with Torquedo, NRS, Bending Branches, Bats and Enterprises, Z-Man. I don't know if all those are still legitimate because it mm -hmm. came off of something that was written. But um, tell me, tell me about all those. Who have you been with the longest, right? When it comes to partnerships. Well, like Jackson, I mean, honestly, was and I'm not there anymore. But uh, they were kind of the first. If you want to go back even further, like I said, Great Outdoor Provision was kind of the first, like sponsor, if you will, if you want to call it that, or that I was pro staff for. And they had a fishing team at that dealer that sold Jackson. And so I, I got put on their team, which basically, you know, allowed me to get some discounts. Plus I worked there. So I got an employee discount, which go. really just fed my addiction um, is what it did. And my check would just go really right back yeah. uh, to the shop <laughs> 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 or I would, you know, take, uh, it was the first time that I realized, you know, by working in an outdoor retail shop, that expanded to where you could go and, and fill out, usually take tests or learn about products from the different brands like Benny Branches or one of the kayak brands. And you could do these kind of online uh, tests and then get uh, discounts uh, or pro deals, if you will. Uh, it's still happening. I saw that somewhere. What's that called? Yeah. So I, there's different websites out there like Expercity and there's uh, there's a few. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. There's a few, but when you work retail in the outdoor industry, got it. Um, you you could just go to the go directly to the brand and usually get a little bit better discount because they want you to learn about the product so you can sell it better. They okay. also want you to use the product, but most people that work in retail in the outdoor industry usually are like, you know, putting themselves through college or something. You know, it's it, and and or they're just not making a ton of money. They're doing it because it's a passion for them. So anytime it they can get a product in these people's hands that are passionate about it at a lower price. There's a lot of that that happens. So that's kind of what I was, you know, doing to feed that addiction and using that extra money from that side gig to feed that addiction with. Oh yeah. No, I hear you. You're... <laughs> uh, I get it. Completely understand it. So a question for you. Um, I just totally lost it. What in the world? Oh yeah, we did a we did a video together. Me, you, and the bearded yeah. dabbler. Yeah, did kind fun. of a. I love doing collaboration type video. This one was the top three most underrated fishing kayaks in 2023, and I took the I took the pedal drive. Bearded paddler took paddle drive, and you took the inflatable. inflatable. Yeah. So tell us about it. Yeah. So with just inflatable kayaks in general, I think I used the CUDA 126 there from NRS, which yep. is a uh, very flat top, but it has a frame seat and a couple of mount locations for like Yak Tech switch pads. Um, and the color is amazing. That orange and kind of green color um, really looks sweet. But in in general, I think I, I was probably one of them too. Like inflatable kayaks just never really hit my radar. Um, Still yeah. not for me. Yeah. So I hear you. And so I, I looked, I, you know, I've worked with Jackson for years and I've got now since I've left Jackson, I've got a new canoe. I've got an old town. I've got a Jackson. I've got a bonafide on the way that I've ordered. So Ooh, um, which I'm, one? Uh, the PWR. OK, right and on. So I'm excited about it. I'm, I'm a, I've just always been a fan of kayaks and kayak fishing. Like I'm a gear guy. Um, so I want to test all these boats out. I want to try them. And um, it's kind of fun now to get to do that. But. I've worked with NRS uh, for a long time and uh, they had inflatable kayaks. And I'm like, yeah, I, I kind of want to try one of these things. And this is a few years ago and they sent me one. And, you know, in my head, I thought the same things I talked about in the video that a hook's going to puncture this thing. Like it's going to get scratched. It's not going to be like a legit fishing kayak. You know what I mean? It's going to be just like, if I have to have this because of space or weight, then it might work okay, but it's not like it's not going to be on the level of a rotomotor kayak. Right. But I was like completely wrong about that. And I think one of the big things was I was wrong about it, but also it has a really unique place for me in my lineup or of my kayaks. And um, again, I'm okay. blessed to have a lot of different kayaks. And so it's kind of like golf clubs. Like I have been able to kind of find the right ones because no kayak and everybody asks this. You know, what, what's the best kayak for me? Well, let me just start by asking you a whole bunch of questions. Yeah, right. To really dial in where you're going to use it and how you're going to use it, because then we can start to narrow that down. Um, but with the inflatable, like I was blown away by number one, how easy it is to paddle and to get up and get moving because they don't sit in the water. They sit on top of the water and they just don't have a lot of resistance. Right. So being able to like 
obtain up super skinny shallow rivers when you have current where a normal kayak would drag the bottom even. So the draft was shallow. They're easy to paddle upstream. And if you have to drag the boat, which I do a lot in the rivers around here, when I get to the shoals, easy. I'm getting out and I'm dragging super easy. And I've never punctured one. Now my buddy, Jeff Little has put holes in lots of his inflatable kayaks for various things, uh, mostly fish fins. He'll get little tiny punctures, but it takes a days to leak down and he just carries a, a repair kit. But he fishes harder than most people um, that I've ever met in my life. Like just harder. I don't know how else to describe it, um, but the dude's a maniac when he's on the water and I've never punctured one of mine. So they're actually really durable. And if you do get a pinhole, they're really easy to fix. So it, it kind of changed my thinking with that. And it really is a boat that I actually use quite a bit. Yeah, no, I love it. Cause I, as you get into this sport and then you're in it for years and years and years, you, you say to yourself, I think I'm going to sell my old kayak and then use that money to buy a new one. And then you buy the new one before you sold the old one. And you just never you get just around to it. selling the old one. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's how well, that's works. exactly how it started for me because I told you I, I got that uh, Commander 120 and I realized it wasn't a riverboat. I never intended to sell it to buy the Kusa. Okay. What I intended to do was make it my flatwater boat. Yeah. That I would go lakes or if I went to fish inshore and I would make the Kusa my uh river boat and it worked really well for and then i ended up wanting to get the cuda when it came out from jackson so that's when i actually sold it to get to replace my flat water boat so i had moving water and flat water boat and again this was before pedal drives i mean your hobies existed but other than that there were no other pedal drive options uh on the market so as that grew then it's like well i gotta have a pedal drive boat and then i gotta have a paddle boat and then i gotta you know and you just start like now I no, need a I, building. I need a trailer. Like, <laughs> no, I love it. I have, I actually have a fish cat uh, float tube that I break out every once in a while. Cause there's places like sometimes I'll travel. I hop into a back of a rental car for work and my, what bucktail calls my sled dolphin. Cause I drag my girls around it around my grass yeah. outside. My sun dolphin won't fit sometimes. And so you have that and you're like, Oh, and you're thinking of all the places you want to take it because I can't, you can't access certain holes without it. And so I have a I have fish cat, got sun dolphin, native slayer propel 10, and a bona fide P127. And I'm already thinking, okay, like, next I need a I need a river boat. And so and then, and then I got a power boat sitting out there too. You go, there, there you go. <laughs> and then you're like, crap, I have no place to store this. I need a yeah, pole I, barn. So your I, fishing addiction just costs another like twenty to forty thousand dollars. You need a place to yeah, oh that's gosh. actually we, we we are working on designing one right now. Hopefully, we can afford it the next year and a half or so. But the pole barn is literally yes, you and me both, man. I don't have any room. I'm like you oh. and me both. Like yeah. I've already like shoved all the kayaks in my eight foot garage as high as I can through like lifts and pulley systems. There's no more room. <laughs> so oh my gosh, so good. All right, let's let's flip the gear a little bit. Let's talk river smallies because this is something that you are passionate about, love doing. I uh, saw a lot of great pictures. I mean, the road trip angler, the idea is, and you're catching fit all kinds of different types of species. And I yeah, know it, ultimately that's where your heart is. Well, let's talk right. smallies for a little bit. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll preface that with the road trip angler. Um, so that kind of came about just from what I've been doing over the last decade, which is traveling the country and meeting awesome people and fishing with them and learning their species. But I've always you know, you think, well, okay, well, what if I go to Panama and I catch a rooster fish and then that's like my new favorite species? Well, that's not going to be that awesome because I got to figure out how to get back to Panama all the time <laughs> or move there, which is not going to go over well. So, like, luckily, uh, I always come back to river smallies and to redfish. Those are just my two favorite species. I love catching different species. I love trying out different techniques and being versatile and being able to do that. But I don't know if there's anything that gets me as hyped as seeing a redfish with its back out of the water and being able to cast that mm. or working really hard to move up a set of rapids and then dealing with the kayak, trying to go back down river while you're trying to make a cat and doing all this craziness in that moving water and chaos and catching a, a 20 inch small. Mm. Well, really a 15 inch small mouth will get me going, but you know what I mean? A 20 inch, that 20 wow. inch we're, 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 in that we're shallow world. Water. 
<laughs> you get, you Jeez, get that. Please. You get that trophy fish in that shallow water, in that swift white water, and you're dealing with it, trying to take you back down river. The river's trying to take you back down river. You're trying not to flip. You're trying to. It's just so much going on, and it's it's awesome, and it just makes that when you land that fish, it makes it that much like more rewarding that you just dealt with possible death. I don't know. Maybe I'm exaggerating. No, no, no. Po <laughs> definitely possible death. Yeah, you could have yeah. died catching that 20 inch. Yes, so, for sure. Could have. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I'm hoping the same thing happens when I start making my own lures. It's one thing to buy a lure, catch bass, you know, that's great, or a fish. But to, like, remeld it, make it your own, yeah. put your own content in it, and then go out and slay something with it, it's monster. I have a feeling that's going to bring me a another level of, another degree of satisfaction. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. I've only done that a couple times with flies, and I'm not that guy. Like, I'm not... Fly tying is actually what led me to realize that I would never make my own lures. And even though I fish with rods from bats and that are custom, I have someone that enjoys building rods, build my rods for me because that's right. what they love to do. So yeah. <laughs> I realized a long time ago, even though it is very rewarding to catch a fish on a fly you tied, or I'm sure a lure you made, which I've never done. Um, but the fly I've done and it was very rewarding, but, I was like, yeah, I just think someone else probably likes this better. So I, I, I'm always really impressed and even a little jealous, I think, of people like yourself that have the patience and want to make the lures and then go catch it. Jeff does that a lot. Jeff Little, I mentioned him earlier. He actually yeah. builds his own rods, too. I need to have him on the show. I saw yeah. him a lot in your videos today. Yeah, so. he's he's awesome, and he's just a wealth of knowledge. And um, he's got a channel as well on YouTube, but a uh, little stuff. And I used to watch him when I was getting into the sport, didn't know him but it became good friends with him. And, um, but he ties, uh, you know, bucktail jigs and he makes plastics and he makes his own jig heads and he ties or ma makes his own rods, builds his own rods. And I'm just like, man, that's gotta be super rewarding. But I'm also just like impressed with like how much effort you're willing to put into everything you do that's related to fishing. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't do it if I lived in North Carolina where I could fish year round, but well, that I, might be it. He does live it in It freezes Maryland, over so. up here. So I have like, you can kind of know, anybody who follows the channel kind of notice my content, how it ebbs and flows throughout the year, right? You get a lot more evergreen content I make during the winter, like how to read your fish finder, all the stuff that I want to spend doing during July when you can actually slay them. So yeah. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Someone said if I can, uh, who said that? Matt Orloff said, hey, if you come up here, I'll get you a 20 inch. Smalley, I'm in. I don't know where you live, Matt. Tell me where you live. <laughs> I'll be there. 20 inch Smalley. I'm good. I got Where's a 19 it? inch Smalley in Pennsylvania this past. Uh, That's past a big summer. one. And and it, you know what? Too, I say we I get caught up on the size because this is how we always do with kayaks. It's so sure. funny how you start becoming a kayak angler and you stop talking about weight and you start talking about like, length. <laughs> and then you try to talk to someone that's like in a boat tournament and they just have no idea like what you're talking about. No. Um, but yeah, I mean fishing like up in pa or whatever you catch an 18 inch fish it'll outweigh the 20 inch fish that we catch down here by a pound or more depending on the time of year so it's it is interesting to see just based on where you're at in the in the u.s or or whatever how different the same species can be and act and what they eat and everything yeah uh, speaking of what they eat segue time um what i i asked you to come prepared Whenever you're fishing smallies, which is one of your favorites, right? 50 50 smallie redfish. What are your top five? What are you breaking out? What do you have on hand to land those? So, you asked me this question uh, earlier too, so that I would be prepared. Yeah. And I'll, I'll be honest, it was not easy. It was pretty easy to pick that top couple. Um, but then as I started looking through my box, I'm like, man, I, I don't know if anyone else does this. Put it in the comments because I would actually love to see if anyone else does this, but I'm really bad to have a very effective pattern that works hmm. and then want to try something else. Cause it's almost like you feel like you might've conquered this or like, okay, I know that works, but what else works? Let me try this bait. And then you catch like a fish on it. And then you're like, Oh, this one works too. I'm going to throw it. Bait. And then you find out like four or five years go by and you're like, well, I, I just kind of quit throwing that one that really worked. And I don't know why, like there was no reason, like I just, I maybe grew or I, 
and that happens over and over and over again until you're like five or six baits like away from the one you started with and it never quit working you just started like changing the way you fish am i yeah. the only one that's like that like i look back and i'm like and so now i've actually kind of started circling back to some of those baits especially since we have the television show uh it's not, I wouldn't say it's as much pressure as a tournament, but when you have a camera in your face and you're trying to make uh, an interesting fishing show over the course of a couple of days, <laughs> you don't really want to like not catch a fish, <laughs> you know? And so you're pulling out everything uh, and there's always those go-tos that you know, whether you really enjoy throwing them or not, there's always go-tos uh, that you know are going to work pretty much all the time. Uh, whether the fish are being finicky or they're being aggressive. And I'm not saying this is my, uh, this is where it's hard for me because I'm not saying this is my favorite, but you always got to have a pack of Kerry Yamamoto Cinco's. One billion percent. In always. the boat. You have yeah. to. And, and this is one of the things that when I really first started river fishing uh, and really trying to figure out smallmouth, I would throw the four inch, and I would wacky rig it, and I had the O-ring tool. Yeah, yeah. And I would just, it's a do nothing. I would throw it up against the bank, specifically in a river close to the house here. I would let that current kind of bring it down, and there were these small current seams, you know, where there may be a log or a little cut in the bank is. And it would naturally just kind of swipe into that spot where those fish were holding. Heck yeah. And you watch your line. You see that little pop. You kind of reel till you feel a little weight and you set that hook. And, you know, that was a great way to just float the river and be able to fish and you're not having to really do a whole lot. And I caught a lot of nice fish doing that. What you know, colors are you? What colors? Do you uh, so and this is a weird one, too. A lot of people are matching the bait. I used to try to match the watercolor. Um, and I don't know if there's anything to that, but it's something I've done for years. This is a, a watermelon with black flake. Um, so any kind of green tinted water or even clear water, I'm throwing usually some type of green colored, yeah, uh, Cinco. Now I don't get re real down in the weeds with my bait colors and we could, you know, you could dive into that. I mean, what I do is I try to keep, you don't want to ask me to dive into it. Well, I, I even listen to me. <laughs> I, I, I have light colors. Uh, natural colors and dark colors and i don't really get into like okay this one has red flake that one has purple flake this one has black flake versus purple flake i don't get that in the weeds with it and i'm sure that if you're fishing super clear water especially like up on the great lakes or something that that probably becomes more and more important when those fish can just see it from so far away and you really got to key in on what the fish are eating and i can see that being a thing with the cinco but again i'm letting the current bring it down into those feeding zones. And a lot of the rivers around here usually have a little bit of color. This year it's been super dry until today, which it's rained all day today, but um, the river's been low and clear and it has been harder to catch um, uh, through the end of summer and into the fall here. Uh, but yeah, this this is in there. And I, I mean, it can be, I, I do really like, I throw Z-Man, I love Z-Man. I have a relationship with Z-Man, have for years, but even their zinkers, I think they call it, um, it'll have pretty much the same action when you first take it out of the pack. Yeah. But that salt wants to leave and that Z-Man plastic naturally wants to float. To float so you have to right. wait that. Uh, whereas the Cinco's, I never have to wait them. I just, you know, uh, you just use a wacky every, rig. Every two gas. <laughs> yeah, the Cinco is, I mean, the zinkers is going to float eventually back to the surface. And you can wait it and you can get a, away with it. But I keep these in there. These are my like... It's not my favorite way to fish. I like moving baits. I like casting and reeling. Yeah. So, but this is like, okay, we're having not a lot of luck. I'm going to pull these out oh. or have one of these on a rod already. So watermelon red flake, use that oh, yeah. a ton. Um, I and I got a couple of different colors, but again, so like one of our rivers here is always kind of muddy looking, even though it might not be super dirty. It just has this more orange tint. So I'll use um, something that has more of that color. Um, there you I go. can't remember the name of that now. It's not watermelon. Oh gosh, what was it? Anyway, it's got more of that like earthworm, like orangey kind of look to it. Got it. Um, but I don't know if that matters. And I do, like I said, I do like an O-ring um, on it. And I do like the wacky rig uh, weightless when I'm using the Cinco. And I, I, I find that a it's a um, drop shot style hook. So instead of having the 
kind of circle really right. um it'll come down and has like more of a, a sharper bend in it okay. and i didn't have a pack of these so I, the only ones i have are these wacky finesse hooks that have that circle you can see everybody can see that so this is there a bmc for BMCs, those that yep. are listening that's actually a wacky rig weedless hook and that works with the o-rings um but i've got those those are sharp hooks those they're are nice. very sharp hooks but uh the the ones is the um i'm trying to think it's a drop shot hook it has more of a, a hard bend in the instead of having that just circle it actually comes down and has a little bit of an angle um to where it bends up and that one seems to just hold that o-ring like perfect where that bend is instead of it being oh, able to sense. float up and yeah. i had better hookup ratio uh, with that and i was able to i felt like keep the fish hooked up when i was fighting them a lot better than i am with the the hooks that are like the bmc okay they, uh, they pin down there and because of how, how the bend is that makes sense yeah that little okay. bend just seems to hold that o-ring perfect and i think i actually have a video on my youtube channel um talking about wacky rig and a cinco and i show that hook Cannot remember the name of it off the top of my head right now. I saw it. You guys can find it easily. When yeah, it's there. it's there. Um, and uh, I actually show that hook. I always take my hooks out of the packs and put them in my little terminal tackle box. So I never pay attention to what any of them are without having to go back and like dig and look. I just know what it is when I see it and I grab it. Oh. Um, so that, yeah, that's number one. Um, I'd say not in most effective, most always effective. There you uh, go. I wouldn't say it's my trophy catcher. It's definitely going to catch everything and anything. Yeah. Like you're going to, everything tries to eat it. Right. So you lose a lot to like sunfish, bluegill, um, rockfish, all rockfish. Stuff. Yeah. Uh, we call them Rock red fish. eye, but yep, yeah, yep. all that stuff. And so you're going to lose a lot of them probably. And you might catch little dinks. You might catch a 20 incher. You just don't know, yeah. but it will produce fish. Um, I I caught a two a nineteen inch largey and a nineteen inch smallie over a period of two days with that with that lure. So oh yeah, it's, it works. It works, and and it, it's you cannot stress it enough. I don't think that it is a do nothing presentation. Like throw it out there if you're in current, especially if you're in current, let that do it, and don't you know make sure that you're not pulling or dragging or making it go faster than. It. And this is something you learn in fly fishing. You know, you're always mending your line to keep it so that the fly is naturally uh, floating in the current and not getting drugged down the current faster because your line's laying in a, in a faster part of the river. Right. And it's the same you thing. Think you got a fish. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's the same thing. If you're, if that bait's moving faster than the current, it doesn't look natural. So, you know, you're holding your rod tip up, you're keeping your line off the water and you're trying to keep that bait, uh, you know, in where you think the fish are and you want it to do its thing naturally. And yep. the only thing I'll do every once in a while is just give it a little lift and then just kind of follow it back down just to make sure that I don't, cause it is a bait that sometimes they'll pick it up very subtle and you don't feel the bite and they'll end up swallowing it if you're not careful. So you want to always kind of make sure if you think that there's something going on lift, if you feel weight set the hook, if your line jumps at all, you know, you're watching your line. So, and also fishing that on usually fluorocarbon leader, uh, because it is a subtle presentation. Fish have more time to look at it. It's not coming yeah. by them wide open, right? Uh, so I'm usually fishing eight to, let's say eight to 15 pound leader on that. Yeah. And I use braid uh, and high vis braid so that I can actually see that line jump and I can feel that bite uh, with the braid. You're going to get a lot more transfer of the uh, sensitivity. You're just going to have a lot more sensitivity with braid than you do. Uh, monofilament or even fluorocarbon because it doesn't stretch right so yeah so here's there's the juice guys right there and, yeah the so that, that, that is that. but the senko is the juice right so if you ever see if you've never seen one of these underwater um they do this the wiggle deal like no other plastic worm does and so you want it to do its deal underwater and if you've never seen it do its deal underwater that's why you want to let it go because it's doing all the action for you once it hits the water and starts sinking um so keep that in mind yeah great tips there all right number two all right, so number two, and this is the bait that I probably throw more than any other bait in my arsenal. And when you ask me about the top five, I'm like, well, do you just want me to give you five different colors of this particular lure? Because <laughs> I always have one, maybe two, sometimes even three different weights or different colors of this bait tied on. And it's going to be the Z-Man Chatterbait. And it was the Jackhammer, which I have here. This is a half ounce chartreuse and white jackhammer 
from Z-Man. Yeah. Uh, recently, I've tried and I just did a review uh, on the channel of the new Evo, Elite Evo. Um, Evo versus very, Jackhammer. Very, I was going to yeah. ask you about it. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm really digging it. Uh, it's a lot more inexpensive. It's $9.99 versus $15.99 for a Jackhammer. Okay. Um, and I've been very impressed with it so far. And there's some things I even like better. I like the hook keeper better, which you can see it's got the lead and it also has like a wire catch where okay. the jackhammer has two wire catches uh, to hold the bait in place. Um, but super sharp hook. It has very, very similar hunting action. And this is my search bait. Uh, I throw that thing in. It really depends on the time of year. Obviously, I'm not throwing that in the winter. It's not a it's not a slow presentation. It's not a presentation that I use in the dead middle of the hottest part of summer that often, except for during those times of day when they're probably going to move up and feed. And it just really depends on where you're at and what time of year. But a lot of the time, uh, especially when I think the fish are starting to transition out of their winter hole all the way until dead heat of summer where they're just slowing down, you know, I'm throwing that thing all day long and it's a, it's a search bait. I can bounce it off stuff in rivers. I really like a half ounce. Uh, if it's super shallow, you can go three eights, but you got to remember there's current and you're reeling it pretty quick and you want this bait to interact with stuff that, uh, whether it's a tree, a uh, limb or a log or a rock, you want it to be hitting that stuff. You don't want it to just be laying in it the whole time you're reeling on the bottom necessarily. Mm. But if there's something sticking up off the bottom, you want that thing hitting it and darting around it. Cause a lot of times that's, what's going to trigger the strike. Now, Jeff little, I keep mentioning him, but him and I spend a lot of time talking about river smallmouth together and he throws the jackhammer and the different chatter baits as well. He likes to pause his a lot. I don't, I reel mine. And because I know that it's going to be coming in contact with that stuff, I just cast them and adjust my speed and try burning it, try slowing it down, and just play with that more than I do the pausing. Mostly, again, because I feel like if it, it's going to hit something, I'm still going to get that dart or, you know, that reaction strike from, from it darting and hunting as it goes. So I throw that bait, like, especially if it's windy, especially if the fish are, like, up in the whitewater, like, I'm throwing that bait a lot. Uh, and... I did bring a couple of trailers here to show because I do adjust that depending on where I'm at. So this is one I haven't tried a whole lot yet. This is a new chatterbait trailer that they came out with called the Chatter Spike. I do oh, yeah. like the way it looks in the water. I haven't had a lot of experience with it. But usually depending on the size of the bait. So like if I'm fishing, there's a river in South Carolina I fish for smallmouth. has big shad in it. So I actually throw that half ounce chartreuse and white with a five inch diesel minnow is my go-to. If I'm changing colors, I just match the color. So that's a big profile. If you've got big shad, smallmouth will eat them. I'm throwing big, big profile bait. So for those listening in, explain what the diesel minnow is. What the diesel like. minnow is a big swim bait. Well, they have different sizes. So Z-Man makes a bait. It's a diesel minnow. They have the minnows, the diesel minnow, which is a four inch. The minnows, I think is three or somewhere in there. Uh, then they have a five inch and they even have a seven inch Jeez. and I have put it on. I have put a seven inch on there before. Um, like I said, if, if you're in an area that has the bait is like shad, for example, you know, and they're five inches long or four to five inches long, don't be afraid to throw bigger baits for these small now. Um, so I'll put that on there. It's got a paddle tail. It's a swim bait. So it's going to give a lot more, um, thump excuse me losing my voice a lot more thump to the bait even though you already got that chatter going and it just it really swims nice and kicks and so any of those uh diesel minnows or baits that are basically paddle tail style swim baits are going to make good trailers for that uh chatter bait the razor shad and a lot of people will use the uh, i can't remember what it's called but uh, yamamoto has a similar uh bait that's designed for chatter baits as well but it's a jointed uh kind of bait fish profile bait it doesn't have a paddle tail uh, so it's a little more subtle and this one is four and a half inches long i can't see it really well is it forked or does it come to a table it does come a little bit see if i can pull out it does fork a little bit it's not split it just looks really more like a real fish fin or it. fish tail yeah uh, but it has three joints in it and then it just kind of widens up and again it just looks like a like a small bait fish um, 
four and a half inch long. Uh, and I get, I just match the color to the bait. If I'm throwing white and chartreuse, I'm gonna put a white one on. If I'm throwing a darker color, I'm gonna find one that matches the skirt, and that's what I'm gonna do. Um, that one works really well when they're not feeding on the bigger like shad. You know, if they're feeding on smaller bait fish, shiners or whatever it might be, uh, that's gonna be a better, a little tighter profile. It's only four and a half inch, and it just doesn't have as much thump and kick. So it just mimics a smaller tighter uh swimming pattern and so that's the two real go-to trailers that i use um has been that razor shad and then if i feel like the fish are needing a little more thump and they're feeding on bigger profile baits i'll go up to the the diesel minnows yeah all right um, right any particular color you like for your evos uh, I love chartreuse and white. I've mentioned that several times but again i think that really comes down to where you're fishing now if the water is dingy and that is relative to where you're fishing too. Um, so like the new river here in the mountains is usually pretty clear. So if it has any stain to it at all, I'll go to a dark color. So like a black and blue or a black and purple um, and something that has that darker like, like color to it. Um, if the, depending on the river, like here's this one's called, uh, I just looked this up a minute ago. This Evo here is hot snakes, which is chartreuse and kind of like green pumpkin. Hot snakes? Hot snakes, yeah. <laughs> I love the, love the color names. Um, I, I really like chartreuse. Uh, one of the baits, and this is not in my top five now, but it should be probably, is I used to always just go to Walmart and buy this Booyah spinnerbait that was a chartreuse spinnerbait, double willow blade, gold blades. And I have caught a lot of really nice smallmouth on that bait. And so chartreuse has always been a color that I really like. Yeah. Um, and it seems to work pretty much everywhere I fished for a uh, small mouth. It's been, it's been good, but it's, it's definitely good when you have shad, if there's shad around that, that, uh, white and chartreuse color just seems to, to, to dial in like it, it works. All right. Um, but yeah, I told you earlier, I don't really get caught up in colors. I keep a white or a white and chartreuse always in the box. I always have a dark, like a black and blue or a black and purple. And then I have something in the middle, like natural colors, like green pumpkin or breaking brim is another color from Z-Man that's okay. just going to have that green pumpkin with a little orange on it. So something, you know, more natural looking. Um, and, you know, you say it and again in fly fishing and match the hatch, you know, you just try to match what they would be feeding on figure out what the bait fish is because that's what you're imitating but the cool thing about the chatterbait is now this is normally when i'm not fishing smallmouth i will slow this bait down and i will do the pauses like jeff does um because you it is a jig and i think people sometimes do forget that it's a jig it just has a blade on it so while i typically swim it you can jig that bait um so you can play around with the different trailers and even put different creature style baits on there and a lot of people will do that yeah okay uh, i'm always That's... running it running it and gunning it you know just throwing it and casting and reeling as fast as i as i can sometimes but uh, it's a great bait no it's i think it's really big fish on that bait for sure i think it's important to know if i mean if anybody's ever how to fish a, a chatter bait you'll get someone's video and they're like i do it this way mm -hmm. not the only way folks just the way that they particularly like and there's probably 15 other different presentations or ways you can work that to make it work for you um great so that was was that two we that was just two i know two? i'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm getting deep how in are we it? on two here we go <laughs> this is great i love it all right hit me with number three because now you get start getting into like oh man these ones were hard to choose they were hard to choose uh i'm always going to throw a top water and this is where it gets hard because i do change top waters uh and and i go through uh periods i guess where i'm like stuck on one certain thing and so lately i have been throwing uh the billy goats and the goat toads from z-man and basically these are soft plastics that float they have a little wider body profile I'm pulling these up yeah, um, and they've got kind of little kicker tail uh tails on them or feet if, if you will that when you pull oh, yeah. it across the water it's just going to plop and because it floats you can rig these with like a five alt, uh, just a wide gap, uh, weightless, and it'll float that. And so you can you can just kind of cast and reel that too, but you can pause it. You can kind of jerk it to get a bigger popping action. 
And that's been a real fun bait for me uh, this last year. The other cool thing about it, especially the billy goats, is they're really easy to skip. Um, so I've been able to throw those like under overhanging trees on the shoreline. Or if you're not fishing for smallmouth and you're in a lake or really, I mean, anywhere that you can skip under a dock. So sometimes even on the river, you've got docks. Um, so it's really easy to skip. You've only got the one hook to deal with. And one of the cool things about rigging it that way is a lot of times when they hit it, it will go running up your line and you're just fighting the fish on a hook. Nice. Uh, so that's that's a, a cool thing about the bringing a Z-Man bait like that is that you, it gets out of the way. Um, you can even I rig love. this thing with a treble hook too. But. Oh, there you go. So I love the Z-Man pop frogs. Similar to mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Very similar. But I, I, I run it on a weighted 5 aught, So yeah. it's just like a foot underneath the water. And I send those through some you know, intermittent lily pads. And my goodness, <laughs> they absolutely slay up here in Northeast Ohio. Well, so. definitely give this one a try because I used to run that. And that one has the, what well, you're talking about, has that more of a cup on the front. This one does still run all, it underwater. <laughs> yeah. All the action on the, on, is on the feet on this guy or all the commotion. So you mentioned that, and when I first started throwing this, I just didn't have any weightless hooks because I'm so used to throwing the Z-Man stuff and it floats. I'm sure. typically rigging it with a weighted hook to get it under the surface a little bit. So I ended up putting this on one of their uh, Pro Bullets, um, which has got like a cone-shaped weighted nose. Yeah. And then you can get different sizes that has weight on the, on the belly of the hook as well. But that's what I was doing. I could hold my rod tip up and kind of burn it and get it to come to the surface and come across the surface but if i got hit or if i just wanted to slow it down i could get it to go run like you're talking right under the surface mm. and so a lot of times depending on where i'm at that's another option is to just get a little weight on there so that you can get it just under the surface still skips really nice yep. um but then if you want to burn it on the surface you just raise that rod tip up and and give it and um so it's been a very versatile bait i'm cheating here because i'm gonna throw this into the same one but you got to have a spook you got to have one the uh, for top water so what's the size you like and is that bone I, that I saw? Spook junior and then i also like the one knocker so this is bone i always yeah. have a bone again light and dark i'll have a dark color and a light color um but you can't go wrong with a spook um for pretty much any species of fish that you're that you're chasing so that's four that is four. I wanted to kind of put that one together because they were both top water. I noticed that. You can have strung them. Really trying to sneak, sneak it in there. <laughs> uh, and then it's a toss-up uh, for me. Uh, in the winter, I'd say this is where it's hard. In the winter, it's definitely going to be a jerk bait or a jig bite, but I don't have a lot of confidence in jig fishing. It's just something I've never done a lot unless it has a blade on the front. Right. <laughs> it's the chatter bait. Um, so I, I end up throwing uh, jerk baits and or sometimes crankbaits and crankbaits aren't typically thought of as a winter time pattern but a slow roll and a crankbait uh i like the uh the little john and the little john md from spro there it is um and i throw when i throw crankbaits most of the time i'm throwing this is a spring crawl i think it's what it's called and then uh the fire crawl which is a red just like in your face red with black and this is more of an orange and yellow kind of combination um but believe it or not, uh, in on the windy days in the winter up here in the winter holes, uh, we've got a buddy that has a lot of luck on that fire crawl color uh, break baits. So that's it's either going to be some build uh, bait, whether it's a crank bait or a jerk bait. I um I like the I go fishing in the middle of Pennsylvania in the middle of nowhere and wade fish and the bombers with the that crawl that dark crawl color. The smaller ones, not the big ones. Mm. Yeah. They absolutely destroy. If you get those bouncing along the bottom, which is typically only like three or four feet of water anyway. Right. Will absolutely just, they'll just pound it all day long. Um, I fish this bro little John in lakes and I can't catch anything but giant catfish on it. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> it like, we call it like the computer chip bill that's on the little John, you know? Yeah, and, right. It's weird. I like it in the rivers, the... The MD dives a little bit further. So if I'm fishing, you know, where I need to get it down a little bit more. Um, but it's been, a, it's just been a good one for me. And it's another one of those baits. Like I don't, I don't typically like fishing in the winter. I'm not a winter time. Like I don't like being cold. Um, so 
I have some options, but that's when I typically do a lot more red fishing. So like, I'm going to, I'm going to go to my camp in Louisiana, which is just a camper on the water, but I'm going to go down there and play the cold front thing where you try to time it right before a cold front so that the right. fish are like aggressive. And so it can be some of the best fishing of your life if you get the timing right, or it can be terrible and they don't want anything um, this time of year. But I typically try to go somewhere salty this time of year. If I can, if I can. Nice. I'm um, I've never caught a redfish oh, we gotta change that. or a tarpon. <laughs> got to change both that. Both are a yeah, bucket and a sure. peacock bass. So I need to get down to Florida as well. Nice. Those are my three. I, I live in Ohio. So, uh, you know, it's just one of those things that, that yeah. I don't get to fish very often. Vacation time's hard to come by, but uh, so you do what you gotta, you do what you gotta do. But Hey, thank you so much for coming on tonight. And I yeah, have probably 15 questions that we didn't get to tonight. So I got to have <laughs> you back sometime. Um, maybe we'll bring you and, and Jeff on at the same time. Who knows? We'll see. We'll, we'll have some fun there, but if you have not yet done so head over to road trip angler on YouTube. And uh, if you like what you've heard tonight, you can get more of that there. So Jameson, um, the one that kind of leads road trip angler and you do a really great job on editing and stuff. So it's, it's obviously clear that you've done it for a while. And so I would say underrated YouTube channel for the content that you're putting out. It, it is new. Um, and I can't take credit for all the editing uh, because I do have a production company for the television show. They do help me with some of the most of the editing there, but not all of it. A lot of the videos I am starting to edit and I used to do a lot more editing for other brands, which is probably why I don't have a lot of YouTube presence because most of my time has been spent doing videos for others. So it's yeah. nice to, time to, to change that to folks. Stuff. Yeah. It's time fun. to change it. So I hear you there. Well, thank you for your time. If you haven't hit the like button yet, please do that on your way out. Uh, definitely helps this video get some more reach on the old YouTube algorithm. And if you're out there uh, listening in from Spotify or Google Podcasts, wherever you're at, make sure you stop on by and say, hey, come over to Facebook, come over to Instagram, come over to YouTube, say, hey, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, so please do that. If you haven't hit the sub button on my channel as well, love to have you a subscriber, putting out content every week. And next week on the podcast, I have Tyler Berger from Bass Fishing HQ. So that guy has a sick channel. It's just been blowing up like crazy. So look forward to having him on next Tuesday night at 8.30 p.m. Eastern, where hopefully I'll see all of y'all then. Jameson, have a great night, brother. And everyone yeah, else, you. see you next week.